Welcome to How to Measure VoIP Voice Quality, our 34th monthly event covering technical, business, and partner topics to help service providers and enterprises build better voice networks. Poor voice quality is one of the leading complaints for VoIP systems. Dropouts, echo, static, and latency can ruin a conversation. Knowing how to measure voice quality and isolate the cause is an important part of delivering a quality experience to users and customers. Stay with us as we share some background on voice quality in the VoIP systems, examine the various causes of poor voice quality, and consider the role that SBCs can play in monitoring and isolating voice quality issues. We'll leave plenty of time for some Q&A, so let's get going. All right, uh, before we move on, a quick moment to tell you about some of the other resources we have available on the Telco Bridges YouTube channel. From past webinar recorder recordings, uh, case studies, many online and many how-to vid videos, there's some content for almost everyone on the channel. Take a peek at youtube.com slash Telco Bridges and be sure to subscribe to keep up with all the new content. All right, let's move on to some introductions. I'm Alan Percy. I'm the uh, Chief Marketing Officer for Telco Bridges and really pleased to have you along with us. Um, also is Luke Morissette. He's our Director of Customer Support. Uh, and Luke has um, been involved in many support projects and helped isolating a lot of their voice quality problems. And Luke, thanks for joining us today and providing some expertise. Hello, Alan. Thanks. Thanks you for having me here. Yeah, pleased to have you. Well, as always, there's quite a few new people on the call. So well, what I wanted to do is um, just spend a moment just quickly to introduce who Telco Bridges is. Um, we're a manufacturer of VoIP gateways, signaling gateways, and session border controller software for carriers uh, and large enterprises. Um, it's an employee-owned company founded in 2002 with about 40 employees uh, based in Montreal. Uh, we have all the hardware R&D, um, administration, and manufacturing uh, in that facility. Um, when we have sales and support offices in Montreal, Turkey, Hong Kong, Vancouver, uh, and now Italy. So we have to add that to the slide. And that's where we provide our 24 seven technical support from those folks that are on Luke's team in those uh, remote offices. Uh, let's go over the agenda. Um, we're gonna start with a discussion on the uh, customer uh, experience and how voice quality affects that. Uh, we'll talk about some of the causes of poor voice quality how to measure voice quality on the fly, uh, the role that session border controllers have in monitoring voice quality. And then uh, we've got a few hints on how to isolate voice quality issues and a couple of logic flows to walk you through uh, identifying them. And then we're gonna wrap up with a customer use case. Uh, one of our customers out in California that um, has got a hosted CPAS platform has got a really interesting story about what they're doing to uh, keep track of their service providers and the uh, um, you know, uh, manage their voice quality. And of course, we'll wrap up with your questions at the end. All right, getting started with voice quality and the customer experience. Uh, I um, have included here one of the uh, many survey questions that came from the SIP school. Uh, in 2016, the SIP school ran uh, a survey that included a number of um, ITSPs and also their customers and asked a, a number of questions, including this one here, which is if you've had problems that were found to be on the SIP trunk provider side, what were they? And um, what there were um, 78 responses and the number one response that they complained about was one-way audio. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, then the second most popular was poor quality, delay, jitter, and packet loss. And of course, that's what part of today's topic is about. And we'll get into that. And then there's some other um, smaller topics, right? One way auto, no audio, trunks dropping, um, these kinds of issues. Uh, so we'll, we're will we gonna zero in on these couple of uh, topics, the uh, voice quality uh, and maybe one way audio and codec match because they, um, they are clearly uh, prevalent in the network. And I encourage you too, by the way, we're gonna send out this uh, slide deck when we get done and we'll include a link to the SIP school uh, survey and you can download that. It's uh, public information and you can go ahead and take a look at it. So this um, you know, poor voice quality is something that I think we've all experienced probably as consumers. You've run into cases where you know, it might be an international contact center or a situation where a call is just not working well or even on your cell phone. 
you know, that poor voice quality, it, it significantly increases errors. It's proven by a number of studies that the error rate uh, goes up. And you can imagine trying to read somebody an address or a telephone number or a zip code. You know, it doesn't take much to um, spoil that uh, voice path. Uh, to then um, cause errors. And what that does, it slows down agent handling and contact centers, which is a real, um, real problem. And it causes stress for the customer, you know, trying to listen really hard through a crunchy call or one that's got a little bit of echo or even has a lot of latency um, can really harm the customer uh, satisfaction. Uh, and um, so you know, a lot of contact centers and, you know, our use case we're going to show you later today have decided that maintaining high voice quality on their VoIP systems is, is critically important. I hope you share that feeling. Um, so let's um, get a little bit of background on voice quality and how it works. Um, and we're gonna start with just um, a little overview of what are some of the impairments that happen. You know, in an ideal world, there'd be no impairments. And, and the diagram shows here at the top is, um, a series of you know packets uh, that are traveling over RTP um, from point A to point B. Um, they're all in order. They're all right on time. Um, they're all perfectly delivered. And and Luke, you can share with us that this is probably the majority of the cases, right? Absolutely. That's a, most of the time we see absolutely perfect networks with with no packet loss, no jitter, uh, and everything is is great. But when we do see some, <laughs> right. then then we that's when the fun some. starts. They tend to fall in one of these other three categories. So either packet loss, meaning a packet just goes missing. It um, doesn't appear. The other packets appear in time. And what that forces the destination VoIP system to do is to take a best guess at what, what audio was in that hole. And that's a trick that the codecs have called packet loss concealment. And you can hear it a lot of times. You'll hear it on your cell phone. It's kind of a robot -y sort of simulation of a voice um, and that usually means that a number of packets are missing and the um, codec was trying to make up some speech that sounds close um, to the speech that was um, transmitted. So that's packet loss. Jitter is um, when the packets just don't arrive predictably on time or they arrive out of order. And this causes all kinds of problems for the codec algorithms. Um, mostly you know, if, if data is missing is one thing, but if it shows up late, or out of order, and then it's got to reorder the packets. And to do that, it has to delay or buffer or queue um, the packets. And of course that causes latency. And latency is like the socialite at every party, she shows up late and late enough that usually uh, it causes problems. And um, Luke, this is pretty typical on satellite and, and long haul, right? Correct, so, so latency, when you keep it short, uh, up until uh, I would say around 300 millisecond total latency, it's fine. As soon as you start uh, going over 300 millisecond total latency, then you start hearing your voice back and delays. And so it causes uh, definitely uh, quality problems. Yep. Yeah, it creates that uh, uncomfortable where we keep interrupting each other because you think the other person's done speaking and you start speaking, then they continue to speak and you're, um, there's enough latency there that causes it to um, have trouble. And then in addition to that too, is that sometimes the network echo cancelers can't deal with the large, large latency figures and you can end up with echo in a call. So some other impairments um, that we thought worth mentioning, you know, codec mismatch, this is usually a configuration problem and we'll talk about that. Uh, echo, which I just mentioned um, is uh, not uncommon. Uh, and we'll talk about where that comes from. One-way audio, again, usually a configuration problem, and we'll zero in on that. And then lastly is DTMF transport, meaning the mechanism that's used to transmit DTMF. You know, a lot of IVRs need it, um, and you have to have uh, you, you know, reliable transport of DTMF for IVR to work. So let's move on and talk about how to measure voice quality. And this is a little bit of a history lesson, kind of a little storytelling uh, to help you understand where all these things came from and what's currently being used in the, uh, in the networks. So the first is um, quite a while ago, uh, the ITU uh, created a recommendation P900 uh, to create what's called a mean opinion score. And this is a standardized way of scoring 
uh, the human speech and, and specifically of how human speech is perceived by humans. And, um, you know, it's a modeling, it's a method to um, set up an, uh, 60 listeners um, to listen to a set of speech, usually using headphones and a booth. And then they're given a scorecard. And for each of the pieces of speech, they're supposed to score how they perceive it, either a five, four, three, two, or a one. Uh, and from that, you can derive for the group, you can average those and throw out some of them and then come up with what's called a mean opinion score, which is great if you have all those facilities and all the people and you're trying to score, let's say, for example, some recorded speech or you process some speech through an algorithm and you want to know what does it do to that speech? Does it improve it? Does it hurt it? Does it improve the per perception of it or does it harm it? You know, narrow band, companders, these kinds of algorithms. But unfortunately, it's not very practical for real-time telecommunication systems because you need to have 60 people listen to the speech real-time on the fly, which, again, just it's not practical in a real-time system. So uh, there's been a couple other attempts at it. Um, and more recently, uh, one of our listeners suggested um, pointing out the uh, ITUP 863, uh, which is one of the most current, and it compares... It's an algorithmic objective method, so there's no people involved. Uh, and it's going to compare a reference input, as you can see here in the diagram, uh, against a um, degraded or impaired output. So the device under test here in the upper right um, sits in the uh, speech path, and it's sending a reference input over to the algorithm. And the algorithm is um, going to predict a cognitive uh, or perception that an actual real listener would have um, to be able to you know, determine the MOS score. And it's turned out that this particular algorithm um, is an excellent predictor of MOS. And it can be done you know, in a lab environment with computers and you don't need you know, individuals or people involved, um, which is you know, a huge improvement. But it still has the problem of is that you need the reference input, you need the raw original voice, and you need the degraded um, that's under test to be able to tell um, what the MOS score is. So this is also really not practical for real-time on-the-fly telecommunications system measurement. So, but there is out of it comes from uh, a lot of this work, um, uh, something called the E-model. And the E-model, is an algorithm that, that uses the signal to noise ratio uh, of the signal, the, um, some of the simultaneous impairments, uh, the amount of echo and delay impairments, uh, and what the codec is automatically just going to do to the speech and puts it all together in a factor to come up with a score. And the result is this R factor and the R factor ranges from zero to 100 um, and can produce a, a score. And you can map the R factor um, to a MOS score using this algorithm down here. So this is a, you know, a method that if you can get your hands on these individual elements, you can then uh, come up with a, some voice quality score, a MOS score. And how we do it in the practical real world is we use um, you know, information about the codec. We take uh, and collect latency figures we also collect packet loss figures and the jitter um, uh, figures, and we crunch those all together into a E-model uh, calculation. And that produces an R factor, which then we map using that algorithm to a MOS score. And um, Luke, I'm just gonna ask you real quick, um, you know, is how does this fit in to um, you know, a typical VoIP system and how does it, um, how does it work? Yes, correct. So then um, the, the way it works is that you know the codec that you are using in a conversation. Uh, you can calculate how many packets you lost in that communication. You can also identify the jitter that you received for a specific call. Uh, latency, you can get it, but you need to have uh, RTCP enabled. So it's another... Mm -hmm. uh, parameter that needs to be enabled in the, in the conversation. If you have all of that, you can come out with a MOS score. Yep. Yep. And you can do this without any people involved and not without the source uh, original audio. Yes. Automatically calculated. Yep. yep. 
and how uh, we do it within our um, our products, the media gateways and session porter controllers, is we have this map, and this is published on the wiki. Right? Is it right, Luke? And yep, you can you can get that. Yes, exactly. So uh, what happens is that for each of the calls that are being uh, passed through our devices, we get out of that a uh, mass score. And we get out of that a network quality with the uh, first the codex that we are using, then what we are seeing from the network. Mm -hmm. And we can calculate the R value and give a uh, an appreciation of this as a mass score and network quality. Uh, and you can see there the, the, the three, three codecs that are presented. Then you see the G711. Uh, gives you the best results uh, compared to G729 and G723. Right, right. So an ideal call on G711 is 4.3. Uh, while you say, well, why not five? You know, why, why, you know, how come a MOS score of five doesn't come out of G711? Yeah, so you can get better than G711 by using a G722 wide band, which has more. Uh, better way of compressing the information right it's a but, wider uh, spectrum yep correct but the uh, regular uh, tdm network and the regular uh, uh, ip network that we see are using g711 as a default right. codec right yep so this mapping uh tells you a lot of information right tells you what kind of quality you're getting on a particular on a particular call all right, so let's move on and talk about the role of session border controllers in monitoring voice quality. Well, first, uh, the role of a session border controller really is a, is a very unique place in a network. Um, it, as the name hints, it literally acts as the border of a voice network. It's the point of entry into a network or the point of you know, ingress or egress in a network you know, between a carrier and another carrier, um, between a carrier and an enterprise. Uh, and this um, this has this unique role, this demarcation point, so that therefore it's a great place to measure, track, and report voice quality, uh, because you see literally all the voice come and go. You um, you see the call set up, and you you, know, you see all the RTP traffic as it passes in or out of the network. So while you're doing the security testing, this is a great place um, to check the voice quality. So this little diagram here. Uh, talking about what can an uh, SBC do. So you can imagine in this particular scenario here, there's two service providers, A and B, and they have a peering arrangement. They're gonna pass traffic from each other. So let's say A is a, a wholesale provider and B is a, is a retail subscriber network. And um, there's for every call that goes between service provider A and service provider B, um, of course there's two-way audio, right? There's an RTP stream going from A to B and another one that goes from B to A for this you know, fictitious call and they're passing through the session border controller. So what, what the opportunity is, is that you can measure the performance of the RTP as it enters the SBC. And this is all done with statistical modeling, as Luke said earlier, you know, measuring the jitter, the latency and packet loss and collect those numbers. And from that, you can come up with a score on the incoming RTP. Uh, and in scenarios where you can get access to the RTCP, the, you know, the real-time control protocol responses that come back from the far end, you can also collect some of the statistics from them too. And with either just the RTP or in the best case with both um, the RTP and RTCP from the, from the uh, um, far end, you can then calculate those figures and come up with a voice quality on the fly. And this, of course, can be used to make all kinds of intelligent decisions. You can just record it, you can store it, uh, or you can start to make changes on how you're routing calls. If you see a provider or a leg or you know, a WAN link is having trouble. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So let's just talk about reporting. One of the things we can do is um, put it in a call trace. And Luke, this is um, uh, a screen scrape from one of our call trace tools. And you wanna just walk us through what are we looking at here? Sure. So um, for each call that goes through the, the uh, SBC, you can go on our web interface and have access to the call trace of each of the call that came through the system. If you open that up, you will see uh, all the call flow of this particular call, who called in, from which network, which IP it used, also the 
uh, RTP parts, uh, RTP UDP parts that were used for the call. And at the end of the call, you will get this information that you see here on the screen, which will tell you how many packets you received, were there any errors in the packets you received. Uh, it also gives you other information like RTP events. You might have received uh, facts and, and uh, all, all these information. And you also get the MOS score, calculated MOS score for this particular call. Uh, and as you can see here, one of them is uh, zero, 00, the other one is 4.3. That's That means we can only get the uh, mass score from the received leg. We didn't have our TCP enabled in this case. So we, yeah. we see the uh, quality of the received traffic. And on the bottom, you see the other leg, the other uh, RTP stream. Right. So with this information at the end of the call, we can then say with confidence, okay, this is a pretty good call, uh, at least from you know an ingress standpoint. And um, that gives you some information. If you start to see some bad numbers, now, of course, now the trick is how do you record these for processing later? And that's where the call detail records come up. You want to talk about what, what this is? Yes, correct. So you can enable call detail records on DSBC. When you enable these uh, call detail records, you can uh, keep in either text files or with uh, radius, you can keep the mass information of every single call that came through the system. All right, so you see here, one of them is pointed out in yellow, mass ingress, so that's a receive mass signal. And if you would have RTCP enabled, then you would get the egress mass signal. Um, but you have all the details of what happened. Okay, you're not limited to the mass car. You can see how many packets were dropped, how many packets were lost, how many packets were sequence errors, uh, the, the jitter, uh, and also the latency. So you can get all these information in the call uh, detail records for a complete analysis of a particular communication. And this is all laid out in uh, on our wiki in the docs.telcobridges.com. Uh, if you search that for radius CDR, I think um, this is where you'll see all these figures. Correct. So the, what we've done is we took a little quick snapshot of a real um, CDR example. And I know it's a lot of gibberish. We have to kind of decode against um, the material we showed beforehand. But here's a call that was made on December 9th at 2016 in 59 seconds. Um, and if you skim through all that from the who, the you know, start... Um, calling, called number, and all the rest of the other details, you get down to eventually we can see the MOS score. And one leg was 4.3 and the other leg was 0, 0.0. Again, that's probably because our TCP was not turned on. Correct. Uh, so that gives you um, an indication for this call that the voice quality or the MOS was really, really good. So if you collect these, then what do you do with them, right? Then that's the, that's the next step, which is starting to process these MOS scores and do something useful with them. So let's talk about um, some of the methods to isolate and reduce voice quality issues. And um, it really boils down, boils down to just some logical thinking, right? Taking some of the factors that you know uh, and starting to make logical decisions. It's um, a lot of those, it's a lot like those charts of, uh, did, you, did you break something, you know? So what was it, it are the impairments, are they carrier dependent? Is that on a particular WAN or LAN segment? Is it time of day dependent? You know, did something just recently change that would cause a change of behavior? So you need to basically have, you know, an understanding of the full network and, the, and you need to have the details of each of the, each of the calls have gone through your system and have all those details that are above. You know, what carrier did the call go out to? Which, which LAN segment or WAN segment did it go on? Um, what was the time of day? Uh, and all the rest of those factors and use it to start to distill what happens. And from that, then you can start to make some, some changes. And we just took four of the most common voice quality problems that run across, and we came up with a, a combination of uh, symptoms, potential causes, and remedies. And I will say that you know for every symptom, there's usually a bunch of potential causes and usually a handful of ways that you can remedy it. So this one particular example here, um, we're going to say, you know, poor MOSC is based on time of day. You know, so... There's a time in the middle of the day when the voice quality seems to drop. And what would the potential cause be is network congestion. And Luke, we do see this, right? We see operators who have congestion problems. 
Yeah, we see it sometimes, but let's say uh, normally the, the, the networks are, are pretty well designed for congestion. Let's say mm-hmm. it's a somewhat easy to an easy problem to find so uh so we if we see it we don't see it very long right got it got it okay well um it, it probably more a case in an enterprise application honestly is where you would see this right that there's Correct. a wan leg that's a um, little undersized so obviously remedies you can add wan capacity um could be you know you need to choose an alternate carrier to solve your problem <clears throat> or in some cases, people find is that they turn on voice compression to reduce congestion, but it lowers the voice quality of everybody, but improves it in those times when there's congestion. So those are some, you know, just some quick remedies. There's obviously a lot more. There's a lot more potential causes for uh, poor mask call if it was just based on time of day. So another one. Um, one-way voice, and we, as we saw, the one-way audio problem is a pretty common one. And Luke, um, when we talked about this, you suggested it was uh, either an ALG firewall or NAT. So um, maybe you can give a little explanation of that. Well, when when the SBC is connected directly to uh, uh, either a, a public network or directly on a, on a virtual private network, then uh, you don't need to go through a firewall and you uh, can send the data and it goes both ways, no problem, right? Yep. But sometimes yep. you need to go through uh, endpoint like a firewall or a natter and uh, you need to configure in there what can pass through the firewall as SIP calls. It's right. easy to forward the SIP traffic, but it's not as easy to forward the RTP traffic because you need to have a lot of those ports open in the firewalls. Uh, and then there's some uh, application level gateways that exist that can be installed on firewalls to control this. But we've seen problems with these types of devices. Uh, they seem complicated to configure. So uh, it can cause problem for sure. Uh, Natters give the same type of problem when it remaps the ports. Uh, it needs The mapping needs to be well done. Otherwise, it will go one way, but it will not go the other way. Right, right. So a couple of remedies, you know, checking configuration, you know, if you can bypass the ALG or firewall um, and then, or setting up port forwarding um, in pinholes, right? To um, allow the voice and RTP to go through. Again, probably mostly either smaller operator points of entry or, or large enterprises where you see this kind of problem. All right, third one um, is we're seeing low MOS scores um, and um, in this particular case here, we're, we're going to, the potential causes, uh, the service providers got congestion in their network. So, you you know, you can't fix anything in the service provider network other than complain about it. Um, so you got a couple of remedies, either reroute your traffic, um, you could certainly complain to the service provider, um, or just change service providers. And um, this is a, <laughs> this seems to be, interestingly or not, um, seems to be uh, um sort of a last resort, but rerouting traffic's not a bad idea. And we'll we'll talk about our use case. That was the one of the tools that they used. And lastly is echo, right? Um, in a, a call, one or, or another call, you might run into a situation where there's real bad echo. Um, it's generally caused by the endpoints, um, either with acoustic echo or um, the hybrid in the device at the far end, uh, or maybe the media gateway or the other element at the far end of the network is not able to um, squash the echo and the echo cancellation algorithm doesn't converge. So you have a couple of remedies, either uh, it, you know the configuration of the endpoint, maybe the echo canceler is not turned on or maybe um, something's misconfigured. And if all else fails, maybe it's necessary to just either try a different endpoint or try a different number or just try the call again. Maybe the echo cancel or converge on the next call. And by the way, this is probably what happens on cell phones more than you know. Um, you get those real echoey calls and the, um, sometimes the echo cancel will converge and uh, squash it. So we will. You know, those are just four examples. Probably we could spend an hour going through symptoms and causes with remedies. 
But um, just that's the kind of thinking we, th we think um, is necessary to um, squash these kinds of problems. So let's get to our use case uh, and uh, an example of uh, voice quality monitoring in a real network. Well, we have a customer network intelligence uh, based out in California, uh, who's built this very sophisticated network um, to host a um, um, CPaaS platform uh, from Telestax. And what they do with that CPaaS platform is they uh, build applications for clients and host them in the cloud to automate processes for the customer. And an example that we showed in one of our previous uh, case studies is for a, um, a 211 service out in California. So if there's a community service that you need, you can just dial 211 and they route your call uh, eventually over to either an agent or um, set up an SMS session with you to um, provide you guidance. So maybe you know it's a suicide hotline or maybe it's an alcohol hotline or one of those other kinds of things. And so they build these applications on the network. Um, and uh, it's a pretty powerful tool. They use ProSBC as one of the key pieces of their network to manage and route traffic from service providers on the left to applications on the right. Uh, and um, uh, we play a, you know important role in their network. But their challenge really was that they, want, they really, really wanted to provide high quality voice for the customers. They just didn't wanna have to you know, deal with poor voice quality. Um, and not all service providers are created uh, alike. So they wanted to be able to monitor their service providers and ensure they met their quality goals. They wanted to make sure they had rock solid quality figures. And then they also wanted a means to redirect traffic if the quality were to degrade. So if a service provider starts to get congested or maybe there's high congestion because of an event in the, you know, in the Bay Area, you know, they can have an earthquake and everybody picks up the phone all at once. Uh, so there might be congestion. So what they did is they used the MOS scoring features of Pro SBC they record and analyze the quality performance and they use the SBC routing priorities to adjust on the fly. So a little quick diagram here shows um, uh, how incoming calls uh, can hit one of our SBC route scripts. And Luke, I'm gonna have you explain how it all works to redirect traffic to carrier A, B, or C. Yeah, so uh, we can have a, a very simple routing table, which then you can choose which carrier you want to uh, send to. However, if we want to go a step further, we can decide uh, how we want to route depending on the quality of each of these networks, or it could be also time of day or other, other features because these uh, routing scripts that we can have can be designed for any type of information that we get in the routing script. And that includes uh, the availability of these carriers are still are they still active? Can we still send calls to them? Uh, what is the relative quality uh, of these carriers? And we can decide uh, and maybe some part of the day we'll send less calls. And but th these routing scripts are really, really flexible. So you can you can decide how you want to route the script with information you have like uh, ASR, uh, the, the, the time uh, of the calls, the duration of the mm -hmm. calls and, and the mass scores and all, all these information. Yep, okay. And this is basically a, a tool that um, network intelligence uses. They, you know, they set uh, the voice quality score to be one of the, one of the criteria for deciding which, which carrier to send the calls to. Uh, so it can be done on the fly. Um, but they also too were doing um, post call analysis. And what they've been doing is collecting the call detail records, uh, putting them all eventually into a very complex spreadsheet at the end of each period. Uh, and that spreadsheet does quite a bit of numerical wizardry. And um, then from that data, then they're able to update their route tables and that script um, then uses the route tables and the priorities to direct traffic. And so they apply those route tables back into the session border controller. Um, right now they do it manually, but um, they could be using our API to automatically update those tables and um, and adjust those routes. So it's kind of a you know a closed loop of quality measurement uh, and adjustment of the route tables, uh, and that way they can make sure they're delivering the highest quality they possibly can. And we have other customers who do this similar kind of work uh, that um, use this tool and this uh, basic process to then 
make sure that they uh, are holding their service providers to their SLAs and to their quality objectives. So great story, pretty interesting. I appreciate Jamie sharing this uh, information from uh, Network Intelligence. All right, so that's it for the content today. So let's get some questions here. I can see um, we got a few of them here. Um, Eliel is asking, what's the meaning of CN and the RTP voice plus CN? Yeah, I saw the question, Alan. If you can go back to slide 21. Sure, 21. Which you will see that? what is uh, what is what uh, he means by CN 21. there. 21 is this next, one? That's, oh, sorry. Next one. Is, that's 19. Get... 20. Whoop. You're too far. Go back. Oh, yeah. No, that's the one with the yellow, all the yellow <laughs> on it. There it is. Yeah, there you go. So you see up there, you have final statistics uh, from network, some information, to network, some this information, area. and RTP dash voice plus CN. CN is comfort noise. Uh, so sometimes in, in the networks, comfort noise is enabled so that there's no RTP packets that are sent. It's just uh, information saying, well, uh, there, there's no RTP packets or so just play a small uh, uh, noise in the background so you don't feel like the connection is uh, interrupted. Okay? So CN right. is just comfort right. noise. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the end here. All right. So um, you'll also ask the question, is voice pressure to redu reduce congestion? Does that mean you have to change the codec? Uh, and shifting to a different codec really means it's adjusting um, the, the order of the codecs uh, as you set up the priorities. And how's that done? Yeah, so when you set up, when, when an RTP session is set up with SIP, it can decide to use only one codec or it can decide to allow multiple codecs. Uh, and the session will start with the first codec that was selected and then it can switch in the middle of the call to a lower or a higher compression vo uh, vocoder. Right? Uh, the SVC, RSVC, doesn't, will not analyze the, the data and change the voice compression, but there are other devices in the network that can do it, and the SVC will follow the instructions to go to a higher compression coding. And I guess when I put that slide together, I was thinking in terms of, geez, I've got a certain leg. Let's say I've got a leg that goes out to my Omaha office, and we're constantly having voice quality congestion problems on that leg. So I'm what I'm going to do is going to move the you know G729 on that particular for all the calls that go to that leg, uh, and that NAP then would use G729 um, to reduce the congestion. Of course, it reduces everybody's voice quality, but it. Um, it would then require transcoding on the fly. All right. Um, so James asked a question. Is a formula tells us the data usage of a call. Uh, if they're using ProSPC and bandwidth, uh, what bandwidth will be used per call when only using G711 ULAW? ULAW? Yeah. So I have a rule of thumbs for G711 ULAW. It's 100 kilobit per second. So if you have 100 kilobit per second per uh, G711 MULA RTP uh, communication, then uh, you have an, enough bandwidth. If you calculate your total bandwidth, uh, number of right. RTP channels num times uh, 100 kilobit per second, it will give you uh, how much bandwidth you will use. Okay, so it's it, there's more precise calculation, but that's the one that we can easily remember and easily calculate. Right, and there's a little bit of headroom use, in that too. There's yeah, there's some headroom. The G711 payload is 64 kilobits per second, but then you have to add, you know, headers and you have some control protocol space. Correct. Uh, and there's a little bit of headroom in there, but you're right, 100 kilobits per second is a good guesstimate. Yeah. Um, the other codecs are similar figures. Um, and if, uh, if James, if you need specifics on that, we could help you with uh, some calculations. Uh, Ernest says, thanks for the informative session. Can you please shed some light again on Moss? Um, <laughs> well, without going back through the whole thing, let's just summarize. Uh, I'll just summarize it as a me MOS is that a mean opinion score. Um, there's a lot of different ways to measure it. Uh, in the beginning, it was done manually. Um, and now there's some great algorithms um, and those ITU specifications. And we'll, we'll include links to those uh, papers uh, in the follow-up email so that you can um, go back. And if you really want to dig in, you can, you can dig very, very deep. 
Um, so, you know, uh, Ricky asked the question, what codecs um, do the best quality with lowest bit rate? And again, that's a trade-off, right? That, that it um, is not always necessarily that um, the best, you know, lower bit rate is always going to hurt your um, voice quality. But I will tell you, and Luke mentioned this, the wideband codex G722, which is very popular, um, has exceptionally good voice quality. It's what you get on your cell phone when you do you know, some of the HD calling on your cell phone. It's often what's used. And that G722 um, is compressed, but it's compressed at 64 kilobits per second. Um, so it's much, much better quality than just G711. Um, so that is um, a popular one. I don't know, Luke, any other to add to the list? Well, of course, uh, G711 is the most most popular one, but it's it doesn't it takes a lot of, of bandwidth on the network, relatively, of course. Uh, the other one, which is used a lot, is G729, which I think gives right. very good results, and you save approximately half of the bandwidth. So I, I think it's a really good trade off. Uh, yep. G729. Uh, yeah, quite a few big carriers use that, just for that reason. Yep. And then uh, links like satellite links and all, they're usually really, really tight on bandwidth. Um, so they typically use those highly compressed codecs. Um, so um, so Matt asked a question, what kind of tools or uh, network, re for re network readiness um, simulation testing would you recommend? So um, I know we built some load testers within our lab, but is there some commercially available um, load simulators that um, people can use? Um, um, I don't, <laughs> that's why we built our tools because yeah. <laughs> there, there are some things that exist, but for really high load, uh, it's uh, sure so some of them can be clunky. So, uh, yep, good. Well, Matt, we'll see if we can come up with something and send it to you separately. Um, so uh, Ricky also asked a question, what codecs the, um, are the likes of WhatsApp, Telegram, Zoom, et cetera, using for their voice over IP? And this is a great question because there's another whole class of codec that is in the um, real-time communication space. Um, our friends Google and Skype and Microsoft and others have come up with codecs for voice and video. Um, that have not widely been used in telecommunications, um, mostly because they're much wider band codecs um, and they use quite a bit more network inf uh, infrastructure bandwidth. Um, but um, it's not uncommon to see um, WebRTC codecs like VP8, for example, or H264, or um, I don't know, you can think of some others, Lou. Oh, um, Silk uh, is another yeah. one. Silk, Opus, and um, yeah. Opus, yep. Yeah. Yep. So these are some of the codecs that um, you might see in those kinds of applications. I, off the top of my head, I don't remember who uses which one. Um, but yeah, they're... Um, and if they're, if that platform then does have to jump uh, or add a wireline a caller, then there has to be transcoding or the whole call has to drop uh, to that low band, uh, you know, narrow band codec. So that's a little bit of a challenge uh, for those kinds of applications. Um, see, do Rick or Patrick asked the question: Do you see SIP published to identify MOS scores in voice quality reporting? I'm wondering, have you seen that, Luke? No, much, we or? don't. We don't use that on our side. I have not seen it used uh, uh, at customer sites either. Uh, maybe there's some specific applications for that. Okay. So the question um, suggest you know what's the best codec for Pro SPC for best voice quality? Of course, that's G711. I think that's that's your best bet. All right, Matt says thanks. You're welcome, Matt. I'm glad to help. Um, Raphael asks an interesting question. So, what are your thoughts on the use of neural networks to improve voice quality? Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, it's a stunt question. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a good question, right? So, one of the, um, you know, what about Opus? Yeah. So, Bill points out, you know, what about Opus? Opus, as we mentioned, is uh, turning out to be a pretty popular uh, voice only codec for uh, WebRTC applications. Um, and uh, it's actually embedded in some endpoint devices, too. So, 
Um, well, we should probably say too, you know, if a, if a codec comes along and we don't have to do anything with it, the SPCs, you know, they can pass all these codecs. Yeah. Correct. It's unfortunately, you know, we just, we can't do any manipulation on them. But, so um, let's see, neural networks, getting back to that one real quick. Yeah, um, you just got us on that one, Raphael. So uh, <laughs> one, one point for you. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like we're at the end of the list of the questions. Thanks everyone for your questions. Um, if you want to sneak one in real quick here, uh, we got um, just a little smidge of time here. There's but, one last uh, question here. I see. Uh, are your does ProSBC support stir shaken? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So that's a good question. Kind of <laughs> off topic, but yeah, stir shaken is um, something that we support. We've um, worked closely with uh, TransNexus um, to create a pretty comprehensive uh, authentication and validation service integration. Uh, both our media gateways and session border controllers um, work in that environment and um, can be that element in the stir shaken environment that um, that integrates the uh, scores or does the validation. So if you wanna learn more about that, again, it's another one of those webinars that's on the recordings on the uh, library on YouTube. I'd, I'd recommend, um, you know, go to that, go to our uh, YouTube library and uh, search for stir shaken and you'll see there's three or four webinars we did on that. So we should be plenty of content there. So very good. All right, so Luke, I'm gonna wrap up, say thanks for um, joining me today. I know you spent a long day uh, doing training this morning, so I appreciate you spending some time here yes. with us. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Yep, and of course, I wanna thank all of you, our listeners for uh, again, joining us. You uh, always amaze us with not only your great questions, but your attendance uh, and uh, you know the 100 plus of you that came today is really uh, what keeps us motivated. So keep up the good work. And I'm going to say that's it from here. And I hope you all have a great holiday season. Be safe. And we'll see you in 2021.